church. How's everybody doing? All right. <laughs> Yay. You happy to be in the house again? Wonderful to see so many faces. I know you're smiling behind those masks. I am excited to have, this has been a while since we had this many people in the house. So let's give it up for all of you who decided to come out today. God bless you guys. It's a pleasure to have you. At the same time, I want to jo- welcome our Facebook audience who's joining us via live stream. Let's give it up for them. And a very special welcome also to the gentleman joining us from the Segovia and um, what's the other one called? Segovia. I'm trying to remember the name. Lopez. Segovia and Lopez Detention Units joining us today as well. Let's give it up for them, church. My mind went blank. I'm so excited. I just want to get into the word. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure to have you guys. Absolute pleasure to be here once again in the house. So encouraged by the people that are here today. So encouraged by just the, the hunger that we have to just connect with our Heavenly Father. Amen. Uh, it's been a difficult few months, to say the least. It's been a fun 2020. Uh, but we're here again, searching after the face of God, searching after His direction. Those of you joining us online, just pressing into what God has for us in this season. Because how many of you guys know God is still in control? Amen? God is still in control. So I have a word for you guys today. If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and go with me to the book of Acts. You're going to be out of the book of Acts today. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. If you don't have your Bibles with you. How many of you guys do have your Bibles, by the way? All right. Look at you guys. I always say the same thing. Jesus loves you more because you have a physical Bible, right? Mine lights up, so, you know, that's the way it goes. Uh, Acts 1, verse 6 through 8 says this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. And then in verse 8 he says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I'd like to title today's topic, and it's actually week one of a conversation that we're going to be having over the next few weeks. Uh, today's sermon I'm titling, Mobile Temples. Mobile Temples. Let's go ahead and pray. Father God, I thank you once again for the opportunity, the privilege, Father God, to gather once again as a body of believers. Father, I thank you for those represented here. Father, I thank you for those joining us online in front of a screen at this moment. Father, I thank you for every person about to receive your holy word. Father, I pray that it convicts us, that it challenges, that it encourages us, and that it breathe the daily bread that we need for this season. Thank you, Father, for who you are. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. One of the things that I've noticed about difficult times is that whenever difficult times come upon a people or, or, or a church or a society, something kind of comes bubbling out of our, of our heart and, and, and of our spirit, and it's a question, and the question is this, what's the plan? <laughs> Somebody ever asked, ha, asked themselves this over the last few months? What exactly is going on? Who's in charge? <laughs> what's the plan? What are we supposed to do? Uh, we're in prayer for, uh, we're going to have a prayer a little bit later, but we're also in prayer for our uh, school administrators or school staff. How many of you guys are in the house today? School administrators, school staff, teachers, those of you involved with our education system, raise your hand for us. God bless you guys. We're in prayer for you guys. I know it's it's going to be a challenging year. We've never done this before, right? Never done this before. It's going to be a challenging year. You probably heard a lot about this. What's the plan? What are you guys going to do? And you're like, I don't know what the plan is. (laughs) We're going to kind of go. Uh, Some of us are looking for plans from our school district. I'm a parent. I have kids in the school district. I'm asking for directions. I'm asking for initiatives of what they're going to be doing because we all want to know in times of uncertainty what's the plan. Uh, Some of you guys might be waiting for information from our local government officials. We're praying for our local government. We're praying for our national government. How many of you guys know we've never done this before? This is a tough time to be a leader. Because as a leader, I've learned that no matter what decision you make, some will agree and some will disagree. (laughs) Some will be silent and some will be vocal. So it's a tough time to be a leader. It's a tough time to be in a position of decision making. But we still want direction in times of uncertainty. Amen. We still want to know what the plan is. We still want to know where we're going. So as I was kind of thinking about this and preparing to kind of meet you guys again face to face, I realized that at the beginning of Acts, I was drawn to the book of Acts because Acts is a beautiful story. It's a beautiful historical uh, record of the early church. It's a historical record of how the church started. And me, I'm, I'm kind of a basic guy. I'm kind of fundamental. I, I like to think basic. And I know that when times are uncertain, the scripture will guide us. And I was thinking about you as the church, and the chapter that we just read, the verse we just read, the disciples are now talking to Jesus resurrected. Uh, Jesus alive again. He had been crucified. They all saw it. It, all, it looked pretty dark for two or three days. People were freaking out what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, Jesus shows up again, resurrected as he said he was going to be. 
So isn't it funny that now they're thinking, okay, you were with us for three years. You taught us for three years. Jesus, we thought you died. And all of a sudden you're back and you actually have a new body. Uh, And they're thinking, wow, this is amazing. We're following a guy who just beat death. That's what they thought, right? And then the disciples say something which I was just talking about. What's going to happen now? What's the plan, Jesus? Did you notice at the beginning of Acts 1, it actually, they actually say, is now when you're going to bring the kingdom, what, what's going to happen now? Are, are we going to be in charge? Because you're alive. So this changes everything. And we know you, so you know, I have connections. <laughs> so if I know you, that must mean that things are going to go in my way. And, and there's a certain idea. They want to find out what Jesus is going to do. But did you notice what Jesus said to them when they wanted to know the plan and the seasons of what was going to happen in the world? Did you notice? Let me bring it up again because it's so powerful when you pay attention to it. Verse 7 again. Uh, bring up verse 6. There you go. So when they came together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They thought he was going to bring back the kingdom of Israel. They thought they were going to take over everything. They were going to kick out Rome. They were being occupied by Rome at the time. They thought this changes everything. And Jesus says this. And pay attention to what he says when they asked him what the plan was. He says this. He said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Uh, you didn't hear the question? I, I, maybe I said it wrong. <laughs> Tell me what's going to happen. It's not for you to know the seasons and the time. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't know anything. We should be aware of what's happening in our culture. We should be aware. But I find that a lot of times as believers, we get so fixated on what's going to happen that we don't pay attention to the instruction he's already given. What's, what's the plan? Tell us. I want to know. And, and he's like, no, no, no. You don't need to know. And he says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. He actually told them, I'm not going to tell you the big picture, but I'm going to tell you your role in it. Did you catch that? Super important. Super important, TFC Westlake. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you the big picture. I will tell you your role, though. Important, right? Let me give you a quick history lesson. On, is it okay? How many, of you got, how many history buffs do we have in the house? People who just love watching the History Channel. Three people. <laughs> Four people. Yay, Jesus loves you as well. Uh, I always tell my kids, if you don't, if those who don't learn from the past are, are bound to repeat it, right? So it's good to know the past. Sometimes you have to go back and, and study. So let me give you a quick history lesson. It won't be too boring. I encourage you guys, follow me along with this, especially those of you who have physical Bibles. Those of you who have physical Bibles, do you have it in front of you? Lift it up for me. You say, you see, you, are you in Acts? Or you see, when you open up a Bible and you're in Acts, you're towards the latter half of the book. Did you notice? Like you're, you're towards like past the halfway mark of the Bible. Now, I'm going to ask you to go to Exodus. And where's Exodus? At the very beginning. <laughs> so let's go back a few years. I'm going to give you a quick history lesson. It won't take long, but I want to talk about how God dwells amongst his people. Because I think this is where we're going to get our instruction today. Go with me to Exodus 19, 16 through 20. Very famous figure, Moses. Everybody know Moses? Verse 16 says this. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all people in the camp trembled. Just a quick context. The people of Israel have just gone out of Egypt. You remember the story of Egypt? People of Israel have just gone out of Egypt. They've gone into the desert, and God held a meeting. This is super cool. I love how God works, man. He's like, all right, I delivered you from slavery. Everybody come in. I'm going to have a meeting with you guys. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to tell you where we're going. So they all come in, but it's around the mountain. Verse 17, then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. You see, it's a mountain. That's the meeting location. Now, Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in what? It's nice and loud. On what? In what? In fire, the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln, and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai at the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. The people of God, searching after God, go to the desert, and God says, I'm going to have a meeting with you. Now gather around this huge mountain, (laughs) and here I come. And all of a sudden, smoke starts descending. Trumpet blasts, thunder, the earth shakes. Amazing power of God as he comes down to the earth and says, I'm going to talk to you now. (laughs) Amazing, right? 
Go with me to 2 Chronicles. Let's jump a little bit ahead. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. Just quick Bible history. Moses eventually does get to the promised land. He doesn't, but the people do. They start having kings. One of the kings you're probably aware of is this king named David. Anybody heard of King David before? The people of Israel get to the promised land. King David uh, it becomes king, and he has a son named Solomon. And Solomon is going to build a temple for God. While they were in the desert, God came down on the mountain, and then they walked around with a tent where God would come down, and his presence was with them wherever they went in fire. So they built a temple, and this is what Second Chronicles is going to be about, Second Chronicles 7. We're almost done through our quick overview. Second Chronicles 7, this is Solomon. As Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Solomon built a physical building for God. Once he got to the promised land, he built a temple where God could dwell. And he prayed for it. And as soon as he finished praying for it, what came down? Fire. Again, the power of God showing up in power, saying, I'm here, fire and smoke. Uh, verse 2, and the priests could not enter the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord filled the Lord's house. When all the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let me just kind of give you a quick picture. What I'm doing here is I'm talking about the people of God at the beginning having to go to a mountain to come face to face with God and, and fire descends. Then they make a tent in the desert while they're walking, and when they set up the tent, fire descends. You see, you see what I'm going here? And then they eventually get to the promised land, and when they get to the promised land, Solomon's like, I'm going to build God a temple because we've arrived in his promise. We shouldn't be using a tent with the, with the awkward pose and all that stuff. No, we're going to build a temple for him. They got the best thing that they could do, the gold and all these things that they could come together with, and they made this beautiful temple for God. And then they prayed, God, please come into your temple. And what did God do? He came in. Fire, 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 fire. Throughout the entire Old Testament, before Acts, the Lord's presence would descend in fire to wherever he was going to be. So the disciples asked Jesus, what's the plan, Jesus? He says, don't worry. It's not for you to know everything, but here's your instruction. Go into town and wait for power. You know where I'm going with this? All right, let's keep going. Last chapter of our little historical journey here, Acts 2, verses 1 through 4. They listen to him, and Jesus actually, after he tells them that, Jesus ascends into the heavens. A beautiful section of scripture. You should read it for yourself. Jesus is talking to them. He's like, go to the temple, go, go into town and get power. And then Jesus is glorified, and he ascends into heaven. <laughs> it's really cool. And the disciples, I love that. I, I was always freaked out by this. The disciples were like, wow. And then, this is so cute, I'm not making this up. As they're looking up, wow, what did, he, did he just leave? What, what an exit. <laughs> and then as they're doing that, next to them are a couple of angels. Have you ever read this part of scripture before? There's a couple of angels, they're like, amazing. And they turn, there's a dude there, like an angel. <laughs> the way he just left, he will come back. Now you go and do your thing. It gives a lot of perspective when people are looking for the plan. It gives a lot of perspective when people are trying to figure out what's going on with this crazy world. So they go into town after the... That's such a cool story. They go into town, they, they, they gather around, and then this happens. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And, div and divided tongues as of... There it is again as a fire appeared to them and rested on who? On the house? On the city? On the people. Verse four, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Here's God's instruction to the early church, and here's my instruction to TFC Wesico on this beautiful Sunday. The Lord's plan all along has not been that his, his presence and his power fill a location. His plan all along, for thousands of years now, has been that the fire of the Holy Spirit, which is his presence, live, hear me, in each and every single one of you. 
I want to talk about that today because sometimes we can just blow right past it. We, 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 we're glad to be back in the house. Hey, man, I love TMC Westlake. Oh, I love this building. I love the way it smells. It's weird, but I just like it. <laughs> uh, but again, let's remember the plan. Was his plan ever that we come together and that this place get filled with the presence and that we can only find his presence here? Uh, I'm glad to worship with you guys. And I, there is something to corporate worship. There is something to coming together. I'm not, I'm not saying there isn't. But you see what his plan was all along? I'm going to descend in fire on the mountain. I'm going to descend in fire on the tent. I'm going to descend in fire on the temple. I'm going to descend in fire on individual people. And now we no longer have a temple that we go to. Hear me? And this is where the title of this lesson come from, comes from. God's work is done through mobile temples. <laughs> Through temples who move. What does that mean? You, 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 and you, you online, you at the Segovia unit, you wherever you might be, you, you, and you, and you. Where you go, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're carrying the presence of God. Massive, massive, important truth for the church to understand. Because if we're not careful and we don't understand that truth, we can think the church is almost kind of separate, right? We can kind of say, I got to go to church, or the church should. Uh, what, 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 what should, what should there's a lot of things going on. The church should help. And, and we kind of do this thing, and we distance ourselves from, from what is actually happening. Jesus, in his awesome power, when these disciples say, are you going to now change the world? What's going to happen now? Is it the end times? And, you know, like I said, it's good to know about these kind of things. It's good to know to kind of just be aware. But I find that a lot of times we get so fixated on knowing the seasons of what's going on in our world that we don't pay attention to the responsibility that we've been given. What's going on with our world? And what's going on? Is this going to change? Is it the end of times? Is this going to happen? Is this going to happen? Is it blah, blah, blah? And then, and then I, I kind of want to sweep that away and say, okay, that's fine. We can talk about that till the cows come home. But do you know that you are the presence of God? That wherever you go, you take the very fire and presence of God. Without raising your hand, I'll ask it. Online as well, I'll ask it. Do you live your life that way? Do we live as if wherever we go, God's presence is in the room? When you show up to work, God's presence is coming into this room right about now. <laughs> yeah, it's exciting, right? Do we live that way though? When we're going to work, when we're going to the grocery store, we're, we're, we're embodying <laughs> the presence of God. No, David, that was for the early disciples. No, 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 no. That was the plan. Let me give you a few observations about this because I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me give you a few observations. One of the reasons why we have trouble with this, this kind of talk is because, uh, observation number one, this feels like a lot of responsibility, no? Anybody feel the responsibility of this? It, or just your pastor? Anybody else? Uh, the, way, the way people see you, if they don't know Jesus, you're representing Jesus God to them. Feels like a lot of responsibility, doesn't it? It feels like a lot of responsibility because it is a lot of responsibility. <laughs> the plan wasn't that we bring people, and again, we love to be here, that we bring people to the house and you, you go to the temple and there you'll see God. No, the plan is mobile temples that move. And that when they come into contact with somebody, the person looks at them kind of sideways and says, what's up with you? Yeah, I follow God. And his presence is in my life, pretty much. That's what you're saying. It's not me, it's his presence. It feels like a lot of responsibility because that kind of puts us under the microscope, doesn't it? Anybody feel that? It kind of puts us under the microscope. So if I can flip it on you, if you're the very presence of God, and I was following you around with like a camera, like a documentary camera this week. Action, right? Go. <laughs> and I followed you around, and then I played that tape back. What was the presence of God doing all week? What was he doing? Was he complaining on Facebook? <laughs> was he throwing up rants about the state of the world, talking as if there's no hope? What's the presence of God doing? I really want to put pressure on this. It feels like a lot of responsibility because it is a lot of responsibility. And in times when there's a lot of uncertainty and everybody else is running around with like chickens with their heads cut off, 
questioning everything, not, not, not trusting authority, not trusting other people, just kind of living selfishly. As everybody does that, church, let me, let me raise my hand and tell you as your friend and pastor, that was not the design for you. That was not the plan for you. You are a child of God. You are called to carry his presence as the mobile temple you are. That's his plan. It's always been the plan. It's not, it, it, this is the funny thing about this. Oh, man, I, I hope, I, I wanted to start here because and I'll, I'll, when I wrap up, I'll tell you why I wanted to start here. Uh, it feels like a lot of responsibility because it is a, a lot of responsibility. There's people in the house today who I'm going to give you just one quick piece of advice and then I'll move on. It feels like a lot of responsibility because it is. People are going to watch what you do. People are going to be curious about why. You're going to feel kind of exposed. I don't feel like I'm enough. All these different things come to that. But let me tell you a secret. That's the plan. And for us to live in that, it feels like a lot of responsibility, so just get over it and accept it. <laughs> I love you. I love you. People are just standing on the sideline for years. Wait, I hope this responsibility will just feel different. I don't want people looking at my life. Get over it. That was, he, that was his plan. <laughs> and, and this leads me to my next point. That is God's plan. It's his plan, not. How many of you guys love being Americans? Americans in the house? Everybody's like, I don't want to raise my hand, David, because you're going to wreck my life, right? <laughs> no, no, I love being an American. Being an American is amazing. We have such amazing freedoms, amen? Uh, when we were kids, we sang songs, and we would stand up, I'm proud to be an American. That's why I'm not on the worship team, guys. Come on. <laughs> right? Where at least I know I'm. Free. See? And then people start crying. Oh. Right? Every time you sing it, man. Every time you sing it. Oy. Oy, my heart. I love being an American, man. We have such freedom here. We have such privilege. We have such blessing. But I'm going to call out a lie that I feel the devil snuck in under our American freedom. I'm going to call it out. Is that okay? Can I do that? Don't put me on blast. I won't answer your email anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I will. <laughs> uh, all these freedoms that we've been afforded, all these blessings we have, the ability to do the things that we do, to worship the way we want to worship, to live our life the way we want to, to start and close businesses, to, to just have this amazing worship. And, and we have a blessing in the American freedoms that we've been given. The lie that the devil has snuck under there is that in the middle of all that freedom, we took a turn and we, re and we started to think that our life, we lead entirely our way. That's the lie. Your life, nobody can tell you what to do. You're an American. You, you want a burger a certain way? Have it your way. Uh, your teacher did something to your student? It's not her. It's not the student's fault. It must be the teacher's fault. If you know somebody within the school district, take it all the way to the top. You don't need to talk to anybody else. You're connected. You do it your way. If the local government or official says something that you disagree with, put them on blast and tear them down as if the scripture says we're not supposed to do that. They just do it your way because you are an American. Now, what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show here is that the American freedoms aren't the bad. The way that we run our lives sometimes that way becomes bad. So when I tell you God's plan is for you to be a temple, you hear that and I hear that and we're like, wait, that's a pretty good plan, uh, but it's not that great. So I'll reject that plan, and I'll do it my way. And I will live, and I will go to church, and David will be the mobile temple, because he gets paid for that, right? And he's religious, and he knows scripture, and he's funny. He can do his thing. With David alone, Pastor John, maybe some other volunteers, those guys, those guys are the mobile temples. God's plan was that all his believers be mobile temples. But I'm going to reject that plan because I'm an American and I want to do life my way. So I will sprinkle in some of God's plan into my plan and make this weird, uh, almost an abomination of a plan. And then we don't know why it doesn't work. Because we sprinkle it in our own and we just kind of like season God in there, like that salt guy from the internet. We season God in there. If I do these following things, then he'll take care of me. What did I just say? It's God's plan, not ours. How many of you guys are in the military? Anybody in the military in the house today? Military men, and thank you, amen. Thank you for your service. Praise God for the military folk. Anybody else? 
Military man, we love you guys. I, I have a couple of, I haven't been to the military. <laughs> I always say, I don't know if I would make it, man, honestly, but I, I haven't been to the military. I have a military friends, and when they join the military, it's funny that one of the first steps that they do in the military is that they do what they, actually, they call it this, but you know, it depends on the way they phrase it. Uh, they break you. You know what that means? They kind of tear you down. They're like, you think life is this way? We're going to teach you life now. We're going to teach you how to be a military guy now. We're going to teach you how to be a Marine. We're going to teach you how to be in the Army. We're going to teach you how to be in the Navy. So they bring you through these, these things where they give you like a, like, a, like a boot camp. Anybody ever heard of this? And the boot camp guy says, we're going to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning tomorrow. We're going to run 15 miles. And you can try if you want to. <laughs> Go ahead and try. That's early. I don't wake up to around six or seven or eight. Maybe noon. <laughs> 15 miles, you say? Can you take one? Like if it's a negotiation. Will that fly at all in the military? Come on, like you get, get it out. Will it fly at all in the military? If you're a nurse and you become a nurse, you take an oath to watch over somebody. Those of you in the medical field, we love you guys. You take an oath to watch over people. To be part of that humble profession of, of being in the nursing program and the nursing association, there's certain expectations of you. You can't be shooting up drugs every weekend and stealing drugs from your patients because you have an issue. And then I still want to be a nurse. <laughs> Give me that license. <laughs> Do you see where I'm going with this? In this world, we understand that to be a part of something, we have to give up our way. But sometimes in faith, we can miss that. And we can say, I want to do faith my way. I want to do it the way that I'm wired, so I can't do those things. And here's what I'm saying. It wasn't your plan anyway. I love you guys. I love you guys. I hope, this, is so, this is so freeing once you get it. It wasn't your plan. It was his plan. And if you have joined the family of believers, can I get a strong amen if you're a Jesus follower? <laughs> amen. Amen vir virtually. If you're a Jesus follower, this was the plan he has. The longer you kick against it, the longer we try to change it. Well, I'll do this, but I don't want to be a mobile temple, David. <laughs> you know how much responsibility that is? Do you know how I talk outside of this place? <laughs> I love you, church. I love you. I really do. It's not your plan. It's his. And he paid a very high cost so that we could all become mobile temples. So that the power of God could reside within us, his presence would change us, and we would show it to the rest of the world. So stop trying to piecemeal the plan. I'll do this for God, and I'll do this for myself, and I'll do this for God, and maybe, maybe let me take away this. Now the finances, no, the, the, the marriage, you know, and, I, and you create a plan. And that's how you've been living. And then you wonder where the power is. Jesus said... Wait for power, right? You wonder why you can't change your life. You wonder why there's no power. You wonder why you feel like everybody else feels. Because there's no power, because we didn't accept the plan, per, per se. Does that make sense? Tough, tough lesson this morning, guys. Uh, Paul, in one particular section of the scripture, and this is what I want to share, and I'll move on to the next point. Paul, in one section of the scripture, actually, I, ha I have it in front of me. It's in... Um, it's a... Uh, Hebrews 6, I didn't give it to the guys, but you can look it up later. Paul in Hebrews 6 sometimes is talking real hard to the Hebrew people and saying, I wish I could teach you something different. This is hard. This, is, this isn't milk. This is like meat. I'm giving you some tough stuff. And people are like, hey, kind of like how some of you might feel right now. But then he says something beautiful. He's like, but the reason I tell you this is because I don't expect you to fail. I know that God is going to do it in your life. I know that God has more for each and every single one of you. And part of it is our understanding that we are mobile temples. One more thing, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, so God's plan, not ours. A lot of responsibility, like I said. And finally, community matters. Community matters. Uh, it's mobile temples, yeah, but look how many mobile temples are here right now. You see it? Mobile temples. <laughs> community matters. You're not alone. Sometimes the responsibility feels big because you feel alone. You're like, man, I can't live like that. Can you imagine if I try to live like God wanted me to live all the time and show his love to everybody in the world? I wouldn't be able to. One of the reasons that's hard is because you're alone. Community matters. I'm going to be talking about that over the next few weeks. A lot of these disciples, when they got the power of the Holy Spirit, they preached his word, and then after they were done preaching, they would just go have some fajitas. 
<laughs> it was beautiful. Like, let's just, so, so read the New Testament with these eyes. Pay attention to how many times they're reading. Pay, pay attention to how many times they're at a party. Pay attention to how many times they're just chilling, like, you know, just kind of eating and kind of talking. Fellowship. Community matters. If we're going to be mobile temples, we can't be mobile temples that are alone. It requires you to be around other temples. And together you can reflect the glory of God to the world. Community matters. By the way, uh, let's not get too cute with that. In all honesty, without raising your hand, and maybe you do want to raise your hand and be honest with me today, that's okay too. How many of you guys during this last, what is it now, five months, six months? We're in August already? Oh my goodness. Uh, how many of you guys during these last five, six, seven months that we've been going through the stuff that we're going through, find yourself in a place where you needed a friend? Raise your hands. Amazing. Yeah. Because you're not meant to do it alone. What does that look like? It can look like many different ways. It can look like, how many of you guys are, know what the word Zoom means now? <laughs> What's a Zoom? Anybody know what a Zoom is? <laughs> we didn't know what that was last year. ¿Con qué se comenzó? What's a Zoom? Uh, everybody knows what Zoom is, right? Uh, I'll talk about a, a little bit more about this next week. I'm going to spend all next week talking about this, but I'll, I'll briefly talk about it here. Community doesn't happen, by, doesn't happen by default. Have you noticed that? If you just live your life and you want to be in community with people, it doesn't happen automatically. It just doesn't happen. Like, we're not, I'm not sure the way we're wired. We're, we're, we don't have the community of people that we should have. And as mobile temples of God, here's my word for you. You're supposed to be, have a community of other mobile temples. And that doesn't happen automatically. You need to find your place in that community. Draw close to each other. The disciples preached that message after they were filled by the Holy Spirit. They came down, and I can't even imagine how hard it must have been. 3,000 people got saved that day when the power landed on them. The fire came out. The mobile temples took their positions. They started preaching the word of God. 3,000 people were saved all at once. And then they all left, and what did they do? They went to go eat. It's amazing. They gathered around food, fellowship, teaching, prayer, and God added to their numbers daily. The reason why I wanted to start here, church, is because in the middle of all this stuff, as I was leaning into the presence of God and praying for you guys, I pray for you guys all the time. Uh, and I'm just thinking about our church, thinking about Westlake and what this whole thing has done to our society. And, and I also had that question that I, I, I told you a minute ago. What's the plan? Like I, even I struggle with this. Lord, can you tell me what's going to happen, Lord, please, in 2021? Just go. <laughs> Silence, right? <laughs> all right, I'll try later. Uh, I found myself asking these questions and, and, and the Lord said, you know, uh, this is what I thought the Holy Spirit was, was pressing on my heart. I, I, there's records of what he's done in the church in, those, in that book that you're holding, in that device. There's, he's shown over and over again his faithfulness and how he works with his people. So despite 2020 feeling like it's a, it's a once in a lifetime thing that we're going through, it's not a once in a lifetime thing that God has done. He leaves stories about what he does with his people. And he says, this is what I do with my people. Uh, they're purposed. And they might not know everything, but they know their role in it. And as I was thinking about that, I, I, I felt strongly impressed on my heart what I titled this series to be. It, it's just a thing we threw together. It's up there on the screen. We, it was called Church Things. And I felt like an impression on my heart that said, look, David, uh, the church body no matter what happens around it, should be about church things. We should be doing things that the body should be doing. We should be about church things. We should be about fellowship, spending time together. We should be about praying together. We should be about reading the word together. We should be about doing what we're doing right now, gathering around teaching together. The church is gonna make it through anything that goes against it, TFC Westico by staying to what they're tasked to do. Church things. Be the church. Do church things. If we do these things, all this other stuff kind of fades away. But I find 
And it breaks my heart, and I want to speak directly to this congregation, those of you who are online. Uh, this might not translate well if you're not a part of this body of believers, but I hope you, you humor me on this. I want to speak to this body of believers that the Lord has drawn to this city, into this place. If you're online as well, I want to speak to you. You're called to do church things, God things, love things, neighbor things, fellowship things. You're not called to change the entire world through anger, through frustration, through pain, through yelling. Because I I see that a lot. I see people who are, man, I love you. I see people who are believers, who have been in this building before, who have accepted Christ in their life, but when they're on the world, even if it's digitally or through social media or in person, they're not really understanding that they're the mobile temple. Can I say that? So if you look at their life, they're not drawing anything to Jesus. And, and I hope that doesn't come off as a condemnation, but how can we behave as a temple if we've never accepted the responsibility or understood that it was his plan, not ours? And we have to be temples. <laughs> So I see that, those, those conversations, and I see the way people behave around each other. And it breaks my heart, and I say, Lord, what's going on with this? And the Lord just kind of says, okay. <laughs> just like the song we sang a minute ago. He doesn't abandon us. He doesn't leave us. He's not condemning you. He's not, you know, I'm, I'm done with you. That's not what he does. Instead, he, he brings a word like the one that I'm bringing right now, and he draws you peacefully back to him. Son, daughter, if you've strayed, if you don't realize that people are watching you and that the moment that you chose me, I made you a representation of me. And here's the reminder, and here's what he's doing today. Can you come back? Can you accept your responsibility as a mobile temple? Not perfect, you're gonna make mistakes. (laughs) If you don't think Christians make mistakes, just look at your pastor. I say some dumb things sometimes. You make mistakes, but that's his plan. There is no plan B, you're the plan. Every head bowed, every eye closed, and we pray for you guys today. Father, I thank you once again for those joining us online. Father, for those watching this service through a device. I thank you for those represented here in the house. Father, I thank you once again for the blessing of coming together under the house, Father God. We sit under your teaching, Father, and we realize today, Father, that no matter what is going on in the world, it'll be through your Holy Spirit power in our life that we would do what we're called to do. We might not know where all this will end up. We might not be able to see that far ahead into 2021. We might not be able to see into 2022. We have no idea where the ship is headed, but we have you and we have our instructions. Father, I pray, Father, that every, every individual under the sound of my voice, Father God, feels the weight of that responsibility today. Not a weight they will carry alone, a weight they will carry with the body of believers, side by side, and with a Holy Spirit that you gave, Father, in power. Father, at this moment, I proclaim over this place, Father God, the victories and the things that we will see when a body behaves like a body should. When the church is about church things, Father God, I know that I know that I know that we will see your hand move in this community, Father God. I thank you for everybody under the sound of my voice. Father, at this opportunity, I want to give an opportunity for anybody who's here with your eyes closed, your head bowed. If there's anybody here at all who, as I'm talking, I'm drawing a lot of lines in the sand. You know, I'm I'm drawing a lot of your life should look different after Jesus than before. There should be a before, there should be a Jesus, and there should be an after. That's the way it should be. And if you're sitting here today and you, 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 you've been receiving this word and you realize your before Jesus looks just like the after Jesus and your life hasn't changed at all. And maybe you, you threw in your plan and you started kind of telling God how you wanted to do it yourself. Or perhaps you're sitting here and you've never accepted Jesus and you've never been a part of his greater plan. So if that's you here today, never accepted Jesus before, perhaps you did at one point, but you've walked away, maybe you're online, sitting across that device, and you're realizing that your life has not reflected any commitment to Jesus, and you feel the need to commit today, or recommit. Can you raise your hand for me right where you are? 
Nice and high for me to see. Thank you for those hands. Anybody else? Nice and high for me to see. Praise God. Praise God. No condemnation in this room. No, con- no guilt in the name of Jesus. This is just the tender love of God drawing you back to him. Anybody else? Nice and high for me. Online as well. You can put your hands down. I'm going to lead you guys out in prayer. It's not a special prayer, not a unique prayer. It's basically me giving voice to what's happening in your heart. Because scripture says what you believe in your heart and you confess with your lips, that's what leads you to salvation. So right there where you are, just repeat this prayer with me. As I do so, make these words your own. And I want the congregation to pray along nice and loud with us. Repeat after me. Father God, I thank you for your son Jesus. I thank you that he died for me. At this moment, I ask that you come into my heart and that you save me. Wash all my sins away. Make me brand new. I receive you as my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that because of my confession, I am forgiven. You live in me and heaven's my eternal home. Make me a mobile temple. In your name we pray. Amen and amen and amen. Let's give it up for those individual church. God is good. Amen. God is faithful. God is just as always.